um, on uh, Skype, we have, uh, I want to welcome Chris, Daniel, David, and Joel, Kevin Bro, good, Leyland, uh, Lyndon Tookie, Cedric, thank you guys for being with us this morning. Uh, we have a great expectancy of the move of God this morning through his word and the study of his word. I want to uh, also welcome everyone that tunes into YouTube. Thank you for watching us and uh, being here with us. Uh, we, our prayers are with you, and um, we hope that this uh, will be a blessing to each one here and each one that's listening out there. So I just wanted to give a big welcome and thank you from all of us to you. And um, I think we're going to get started in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 8 this morning. Uh, is that correct, guys? I think we finished chapter 7 and we're going on to chapter 8 in 2 Corinthians. Yeah, that's correct, Tom. Okay. Um, so why don't we start off with um, this? these two chapters are, um, may, may not take us as long to go through um, because of uh, the subject matter. And um, so why don't we start off with someone who would like to read, uh, would read uh, this for us this morning. Chapter 8, 2 Corinthians. I'll read it. Yeah, I don't mind, Tom. Oh, yeah, you read it. Yeah, of course, you read it. <clears throat> this is the uh, King James Version. It says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power, I bear record, Yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering up to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave themselves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that yea, through his poverty might be rich. And here I, I give my advice, for this is expedient for you who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore, perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burden, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. As it is written, he that hath gathered much had nothing over, and he that hath gathered little had no lack. But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. For indeed, he accepted the exhortation, but being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. And we have sent with him the brother, whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us with his grace, which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord and declaration of your ready mind. Avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us, providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, 
but also in the sight of men. And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you. Our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. Wherefore, shew ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boastings on your behalf. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you, Sister, for reading that. Okay, let me ask you the group of uh, what do you, what does it show here that, that Paul is talking about? He's talking about them doing something. What is he talking about them doing here? I I, th I thought it was about providing um some assistance from, from what they've gained maybe in their um their abundance during the last year, and that may be um in material things to, to provide for to provide for their brethren also in another church to to make themselves ready to uh, to be provided for that when those other other uh, um, ministers of the gospel come to them so, so that they're ready for them to take their offerings to the other church so they're mutually helping out the other churches um and and in, in order to um prove themselves a the love of god works within them that's that's how I how, how I see it anyway. Daniel, I guess you kind of like uh, uh, First Corinthians sixteen um, one and two says um, where Paul was actually telling us that now concerning the collection for the saints, as I, as I have given order to the churches in Galatia, even so do ye upon the first day of the week let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him that there be no gathering when I come. So. Uh, he would say it was something in that manner of, of gathering a collection for for the saints. Is that right? Is that what yeah. you're saying? It seems it seems to be. Um, yeah, because it seems to also imply that from chapter nine as well. But I, I, I sense I sense that seems to be what it's what it's saying, um, you know, to um, to fill up the love of God that they they have from receiving the gospel and also, you know, receive um, f fruits of the spirit by doing so, you know, whereas, um, and I do it out of love, not do it out of um, um, requirement, but, but from the love of your heart, offer and give to support other churches that are in need. In verse 15, it, it says here, as it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over and he that gathered little had no lack, but thanks to God would put the same earnest care uh, into the heart of Titus for you. We we, we recall mm -hmm. in in, uh, in Acts, uh, the the end of chapter two, when there was a great outpouring of, of the Holy Spirit and um, and, and great move of God, that uh, seems they were in all through the book of Acts, Acts chapter five also, where they were actually selling their possessions and laying them at the apostles' feet, and they were distributing to those that. Uh, that everyone had equality, kind of like what he's talking here. Do, do you think maybe that he's talking to these people that had made some sort of commitment in that same way and Paul was encouraging him to go through with it? Um, it seems to somewhat indicate that as well, as if they were, so he, because he talks about those that, that would lack would have nothing, would lack nothing, and those that would, had abundance would have nothing over. They, everyone would be by equality. Uh, do you think this is what they were they also talking about here? I, I think so. I think I think it also, you know, proves their love. You know, I don't th I don't think it's done out of uh, necessity. It's not it's not it's not akin to like tithing under the old covenant. But it, but it but it but it shows the love and abundance from the heart to offer and give to those in need that are also brothers in Christ. Mm -hmm. That that's that's how I that's how I see it. Anybody else have a comment on that? Yeah, it, it appears even in their own need, they gave from their own need in abundance. It, it's a deep personal application as well as a corporate thing, not just the group, the entity, the church at Corinth or the church at Ephesus. 
but it would it went to the individual at the church they took it upon themselves it was personal from their own deep need they gave mm -hmm. and paul wasn't looking for the money for the sake of the money but for the sake of the heart attitude that would give in such great need they took it personal they took it home they took it and said this is my job each one of them I, that's that's the sense I feel from it that I see in it. <clears throat> yeah, uh, Jenny just said in the background. She said uh, when Christ brought example to the the woman with the two mites, she gave everything, mm -hmm. and he didn't stop her. He commended that's her. That's right. She 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 gave she gave from the heart, didn't she? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was it was the heart, that, and that's. That's what I was trying to share earlier. You know, in this world of, of religion and this world of, of pretend that when we really live this and when we take it down to the heart level, um, well, when you get something instead of, instead of saying, I'm going to give this uh, tenth of this to God, it's, it's all his. It, everything's his. Maybe we'll keep 10%. <laughs> instead do you see the point it's, it's all a, all. what is the intent of my heart do I fit God in or do I fit in God money yeah not just in money and my resources and time and, you know what, what should I be doing you know the American dream is really a nightmare for a Christian instead of cruising off into the sunset we should, we should be working ourselves to death serving our you, you've, Lord. Well, you've hit a nail on the head there with, with, with that. And I think, I think culturally in the West, th this idea of giving becomes difficult because, because of our Western mindset, our exactly. sort of accumulation of, of wealth and our way of life sort of seems to be built on success and career this, more money this, bigger house that. And, and, that, and that's not the reality of, I think, a Christian. You know, um, and I'm so thankful for you guys because I've seen groups that come together and they, and the Lord shows them the truth and, and it, uh, opposite of what the religious world has out there. And they will sometimes be tempted or so do as to eliminate a lot of the teachings in the scriptures because the religious world out there does them. Um, I've, I've been um, told myself by some, uh, well, I don't, you know, like we have communion, you know, sometimes when we meet together, just about when we meet together on Sundays, because the scripture talks about that the Lord said, as often as you come together to, in remembrance of me, to eat this. And I've had some say, well, I'm really bothered by you guys having communion. And I said, well, why? I said, well, that's what the church world does out there. You know, it's just such a... Um, tradition or relic, you know, what have you. Then another one came to me and preaching out at the open air meeting and I posted those videos and he said, I'm really bothered by you uh, inviting people to come up to get, get prayer. And I said, well, why? Well, because, you know, that's kind of what a lot of the church does out there to uh, come up and do a sinner's prayer. I said, well, I didn't say a sinner's prayer, but anyway, that was sort of the thing. Then another one mm. says, well, I'm not giving to any preacher or any church, you know, and because that's what the religious world does out there. And, and you know, one, one fellow I heard him say, you know, well, the Catholic Church believes in the virgin birth. But us believing in the virgin birth doesn't make us a Catholic just because we believe something the same. That you can't throw out everything because it's in the word of God. And I, that's what I like about being here is that. We, we want to stick to the, we do, we stick to the word of God. If the word of God says it, hey, that's the end of the story because that's the authority in our lives. And, um, and, and so here you see, I've, I've seen this thing on giving and receiving and I've heard people talk about, it. well, they just basically not giving at all or don't want, or won't give. And I can understand that. Don't do that to aid some ministry that is preaching a lie and sending people to hell. Definitely don't do that. But that doesn't mean throw it out because we have many, many scriptures in the Bible that talk about that we should be a giver. You know, uh, that when we see a brother or sister in need, we, we're to help them, we're to give. A matter of fact, yeah. even in the scripture you just talked about, Dave, where it says, it, it says in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23, 
He's speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees. He says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you pay, you pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, like judgment, mercy, and faith. He says, these you, you ought to have done and not to leave the other undone. So he didn't say to just quit, tells them to quit tithing. He says, no, you left that out. You ought to do the, th the judgment, mercy, on it, but, but don't leave this out either. You know, and I think a lot of people just leave out the giving, and when we have so many scriptures that we could go through, and may even want to, to show mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, that we're to work with our hands so that we have to give to those that are in need. Um, you know, that Paul talked about in Philippians 4 about um, how, how he, he had need and that they supplied his need. And he said it wasn't because I wanted money, it was because it was going to be a blessing to you. He talks about those that live by the gospel, those that preach the gospel ought to live by the gospel. And, and um, so forth and so on, many, many scriptures. But somehow it gets thrown out as to thinking that, well, I'm just not going to give anything, you know, because, you know, that's what the church world does, the religious world does. We have to do what the word of God says to do out of love. Somebody may have a comment on that. No, I think, Don, you've, you've uh, that's, that's wonderful words. I, I, I think, especially within Christianity, they they. They, they will, in, in, in the main, say they're not under the law and they're, and they're very keen to say we're not under any mosaic law. But of course, they all we all know that a lot of churches go to Malachi and try and bring up, trying to force its people under 10 yeah. percent tithe type, type example. But but I think it's, it's deeper than that. In the New Covenant, obviously, we know that we, we've died to self. We, we've died to that body of sin. It is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. I, I've given my entire self to the Lord. Not just 10 percent, every, everything, sure. you know, like sure. Romans 12 tells us we're living sacrifices to the Lord. So actually everything we have now is dependent on the Lord. It's that it's that level of trust that we should now in our mind be be accepting. Amen. Amen. Uh, someone else have comment? Well, that's, it, it, I forget which Pauline epistle, Don. I'm sorry. I, my memory's shot anymore. I had a stroke a couple of years back, and uh, my, my memory's bad. Uh, I remember the story, just not who wrote it. Um, now I forget the story. I was just going to say it. Oh. Help him, Lord. <laughs> oh, yes. What, what true religion, and James, when it, what came down to what true mm. religion was, was to mm -hmm. do what? have the biggest church have the biggest outreach have the biggest no oh. no it was to what reach out to the widow the fatherless to defend the defenseless that was part of god's god's command not not our perspective that's what christ lived he taught them that he the beatitudes was not for one moment of the day or one moment in a lifetime to live in that life of humility to live in that life of showing the world god around them in a world that doesn't see him Amen. that's that's yeah. when we know was it god i'm sorry go ahead no, J James, James 127, you're quite right. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, pure, pure, pure religion and undefiled before God and the father is this to visit the fatherless and widows in their effect, in their affliction, uh, to keep himself unspotted from the world. I mean, I, I, I mean, I've, I, I used to think I think there's a deeper spiritual truth to this. Um, personally, you may you may um, you may see this as well. But um, I view this as actually preaching the gospel to people as being the most important because people that are outside of God or do not believe in God and his Christ are essentially fatherless and widows. They, they don't, they don't have a father. Their father isn't Abba father yet. And they aren't um, betrothed to, um, uh, they need to be part of the bride in order to have the bridegroom. So I think, I think this relation to fatherless and widows is, is, is talking about bringing someone into the gospel. Yeah. Amen. And then it says, obviously, that last bit there was to say, sorry, to keep himself unspotted from the world, which 
which, as we know, you know, when we've brought into the gospel and we've died to self, we are to walk walk by the spirit and not to go back to darkness. So this sort of this is almost given us the gospel just in that verse as well. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's not meant to be a social gospel of outreach. No, 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 no. The uh, no. the 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 intent by keeping ourselves uh, unfettered, unspotted from this world is showing when you are taking that person food, clothing, as in James, if a brother or sister is naked, or well, who's our neighbor? Well, everybody. Well, 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 wait. That changes the whole story. <laughs> Now, now we do have an obligation for the person who is beaten and robbed and left. It might not be a physical beating. It could be in court. It could have been a bad legal decision. It could have been something wrong in a marriage that went horrifyingly wrong, not in his favor or her favor, where we do have to step in. And why would we do that? Because we're bored? We're do-gooders? No, because of the love of God, that if it was not for his grace, there go I. I relate that that could be me, and my heart goes out. That's what I think, the true love of the gospel. That's what drove Christ for his father. Mm. Another uh, verse down there, it says, for I mean not that others men be eased and ye be burdened uh, because it, it was a temptation I think to and even in the early church with that was to um, you know to to have some in there that didn't want to work and you would end up working and they'd be taking advantage and getting what you had so they you know some would be burdened by that and this but the scripture says that if he doesn't work neither should he eat you know Paul had brought those the scriptures out teaching that you, you know you're not to you're not to supply the need for that person it, he just doesn't want to work he's just lazy and so you're just paying his bills you're enabling him he said don't do that you know the, withdraw yeah. yourself their brother would withdraw yourself so there's a balance there in that you don't uh, just give to everybody just because they say that they have a need if, if they're, they're they're not working and you're working and other people are working then you may not want to give to them. Absolutely. There's always the problem of enabling and not doing the right thing. But the list in James makes it, makes it clear that it's, these are people who are so disadvantaged in the system that they have no way back. And that's when true religion says, now I go beyond wishing them well and praying for them and meeting their needs. Amen. You know, and, and what you said, brother, I'll tell you what, I've, I know exactly what you're talking about uh, in ministry and uh, being uh, used in ministry again and again and again. It's, there are a lot of people who will quickly take everything. Mm -hmm. But that's for God to figure out. Yeah, you give in faith, you know, so it's, that's it's right. between them and God messing up because that, that does happen. You're, you're but he does tell us to get wise, too. <laughs> he yeah. does tell us to be good stewards of what he gave us in balance. It's always in balance, the intent of our heart. Yeah, it's kind of like that woman you were talking about earlier. The Bible said she gave out of her need. I mean, that, that woman, uh, she didn't have much, but her heart was to to give in, in the right. lord and 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 she she gave it our need and and some people we could think well i want to work hard so that i get all my bills paid for and i can you know i don't have these bills and i don't have all this and and that's can be really a selfish way of thinking you know working because the scripture says the reason you're working is so that you have to give to those who are in need not to spend it on yourself he even goes in first timothy 6 and he says that to warn the rich to be ready to distribute you know be ready to give it out you know because we're we're called yeah. to lay down our lives for the brethren uh, james even said that when he compares faith to works and he says you see a, a, a brother in need and you and you say you have faith and brother i'm, I'm believing you're going to be clothed and fed and you let him go and you don't do anything he says your faith is worthless 
You don't have you. You saying you're in Christ. <laughs> you saying all this, but you're, you're really not even in Christ. It's worthless because you don't really care about the needs of other people. You're so focused on your own needs and not focused on helping other people. And that's what Jesus did. He said he, he was he was rich, but became poor for our sake. He gave everything he had. Do you know what I kind of found in religion? In religion, I forget whatever the name of the religion is. They're all the same in this manner. There's always a debate over what is the right thing to do. Well, who sinned, this man or his parents? Remember the Pharisees or the mm -hmm. Sadducees? Uh, or yeah. what about this or what about that? And they always stood there and debated. And Christ stopped and did something about it. The religious world debates it. The Christ-like action is to do something about it, which takes actions. Right. So it takes faith, heart, which takes genuine faith, doesn't it? Exactly. And in perfect love, it casteth out fear of reprisal. Because if you no longer fear the reprisal, because you do it for mm. your Father, who's in heaven, then you sound like and act like his son and it, it really it, it does come down to that simple no, not easy to do but that is our battle that's our call to realize that this is not a debate it was never meant to be an intellectual counterpart uh, and not a conversation but it was to affect the very actions of our heart so that we couldn't help but when confronted respond from that very same love when you get so when we get captivated by what he did for us how could we not have him do that for everyone hallelujah that that's oh, good. that's the wrestle i see in in the scripture oh, good good words really good words amen praise be to god <laughs> Let's let's go through a few scriptures if y'all don't mind on, on just yeah, giving, don't, yeah. giving and receiving. Would that be okay with you guys? Yeah, very good. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Let's go to Second Corinthians um, um chapter eleven, if you guys would. And um if somebody wants to read from verse uh, six to verse um, nine, I can do it. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, Second Corinthians, yeah, chapter eleven, verse chapter six 11, to nine. Verse six through nine. Yes, sir. All right. I may not be a trained speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. What is a sin for me? Uh, what was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. And when I was with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I have kept myself from being a burden to you in any way. And we will continue to do so. Yeah, he seems to be indicating there that, that this church wasn't uh, was essentially a giving much of a giving church in helping him in ministry. There um, that he had to rob other churches, my, as King James says, in order to have the, his need met instead of the church actually, you know, helping and, and ministering to him in their finances. Uh, any other comments on that scripture? No, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I, I think I think taking in you know, obviously both letters to the Corinthians, it seems as if, you know, they had um, they still had um, in some some of them carnal minds and toleration of certain types of behavior and they were still babes in christ in a way so so paul was exhorting them all the time to to demonstrate to them what a genuine love or being in the faith was amen yeah i think when he when paul writes uh philemon and he says listen 
I could tell you to do this, but for your love for what I've done for you in Christ, receive him as a brother instead of a slave. So rather than saying I could command you from the scripture, just like I, I have the right, like an ox has the right to the grain that it plows. I had a yeah. right to the gospel, but I chose it not so I would not be a burden. Mm. I think Paul's heart is very, very bold right to the end as he writes about to, uh, the letter of Philemon. Yeah. Let's go to uh, if, if we if anybody else has a comment, uh, fine. But let, let's go to, if we don't. Let's go to Philippians chapter four. Yep. And um, Daniel, would you mind reading from uh, verse ten to verse seventeen? Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. So uh, King James Version. <clears throat> um, but, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now, ye Philippians, know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Mm, amen. Mm, amen. So, so we see here that Paul said, hey, I, I'm content. I've learned to to live with not having anything and I've learned to have live with, with having it. He said, um, he's basically saying that I, I'm, I'm fine with it, but it's not really about me. It's about you. He said, I want to see fruit come from uh, your uh, life of giving, you know, and uh, that was a blessing because uh, he, he was admonishing them to give and to communicate, not to be selfish in what they had, but to help the ministry, to support the ministry. Mm. Anyone else have a comment on that? Yeah, I think it's, it's a clear principle, though it doesn't look like the same picture, but it's not until there's a personal involvement from an individual in God's word or God's plan that it affects his life. For example, when David uh, numbers Israel and, and, and God breaks out in this great wrath against them, and he goes to the threshing floor of Onan, and he says, and he says, here, I'll just give you the floor and then the oxen. And David says, no, I'll, I'll sacrifice nothing to the Lord. That then cost me something. Mm -hmm. He said, I won't do it. It has to cost. And we've, we've run into a world that doesn't cost anything. And, and until we can give through that, that need, are we being real to ourselves? Are we being real that we believe in our God if we don't give, if we don't support? You know, when we stopped going to churches, it was like, what do we do? Well, how do we do this? Where do we do this? You know what? We live in a very affluent country, but there's a lot of hungry people not far from where we live. Yeah. There's food banks. There's places to donate. There's places to work and give and to give back. And I don't believe in a social gospel. I believe that while I'm out doing this, while I'm out there with my cane in my right hand, <laughs> handing food out, and I'm all beat up looking, and they're asking me why I'm so happy, I get to tell them about my God. And they thank me, and I thank them. And I tell them, no, thank you. It's beautiful. Amen. Amen. Um. 
if, if unless somebody else has a comment, let's go to um, which we're in Second Corinthians eight, but let's go to Second Corinthians nine because they really they really tie in together. If you would, let's go to Second Corinthians chapter nine, and we'll start at verse five. Second uh, Corinthians chapter nine verse five. Uh, who would like to read? Or who would want, who would read? <laughs> Chris, anybody? Okay. I don't mind. I don't mind. I'll carry on reading. Go, go ahead, brother. Um, so from from verse five in chapter nine. Uh, Therefore. I, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever do you want me to carry on reading um, yeah, I'll wait, I'll wait to 13 go to 13 well let's just finish the chapter let's just go ahead go ahead okay. now he that ministereth seed to the sower both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness being enriched in everything to all bountifulness which causeth through us thanksgiving to god for the administration of this service not only supplieth the wants of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. And by their prayer for you, which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Mm, mm. That's, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he said, he's saying here about how to give now. Now he's kind of given the attributes of it of saying, yeah. you don't give grudgingly, give cheerfully because God loves a cheerful giver that you're able to be able to help them. And he says, that he'll make all grace abound to you, towards you, uh, that you always having all sufficiency and all things may abound to every good work, that he will, you'll be blessed and as a cheerful giver to, the, to, uh, to, to help the needs of the brethren and those that are need. Powerful. Doesn't it, doesn't it really, Don, I, I, I think it, uh, for me, I'm being convicted right now, actually, but um, I, I think it really gets to the heart of what faith is about. I mean, faith is, belief in something that we don't see um and the reluctance of people to give is probably because they're thinking well i'm going to be i'm going to be without something then or, mm -hmm. uh, where am i going to get my supply from they're, they're not completely tr trusting having faith in the lord that he can clothe them he can feed them he, he gives them their their want and it's 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 that leap of faith which is which is a real difference in 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 what a believer needs to have in his heart. That, that's that's so good uh, that you said that, uh, brother. Because um, I've had the same thing. You know, uh, when you start talking about people's pocketbooks, everybody seems to get a little nervous. You know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. but here, and, and it's not it's not a subject a lot of people like to talk about. You know, but it, it's in the word. And when you're a cheerful <laughs> giver, you know, and you give to, to help the, the brethren and those that are in need, uh, it, it's a blessing, you know, because God has promised towards you. But it's not, you're not giving just to get something back. You're giving so that you can help because you love them. 
Uh, and that mm. is the whole gospel. He, he says in uh, what John 13, 34, a new commandment I given to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, so also love one another. And by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, by your love one for another. And what, what greater love mm. does a man have than he lay down his life, his finances, everything he has. But a person can easily be selfish. And I hear so many people say this, uh, Daniel and all of you, oh, I, I'm mm. just working so I can uh, get all my bills paid for so I can go go uh, be free in the ministry or go do this or go do that. And you don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know that, you you, you know, uh, what's going to happen. But one thing is that he kind of, that's why he says, lay up your treasure in heaven where moth and rust and dust doesn't corrupt it. Uh, make friends of the unrighteous mammon he talks about so that they will receive you into everlasting habitation. He talks about giving your life, your finances, your everything to, for the ministry as a cheerful giver and not, if you're going to do it grudgingly, yeah, right. You don't even need to get it. You need to get your heart right. But, but if your yeah. heart's right, you want to give, you want to support, you want to get this word out. You want to do whatever it is that needs to be done. Not giving it to those out there that are preaching false doctrine. That would be terrible because you're getting a, you, you're aiding in, in sending people to hell. But for the truth, we need to do whatever we can and we need to help those that are in need. Amen, Don. Amen. Amen. We do not need to be accomplices in the bad message and the bad doctrine. <laughs> no. Absolutely not. No. That's why I, I encourage people when we talk, they say, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I don't want to give away my rewards. But I can tell you that what we found is that there are people in need everywhere, everywhere, all around you. And God brings them into your life in all sorts of ways, whether you're getting a new phone and you take extra long with the person helping you. And the next thing you know, you're the stepfather that they needed so badly that just happened to me literally mm -hmm. um god has worked marvelous things out in just the smallest of ways and even if let me tell you even if you even if you won the lottery which none of us would play because we don't do that but if we did or if someone died that you didn't know left you all the money in the world if your health went away what would you do then what would what would the excuse be for me now so you see, we quickly can run out when the real issue comes down to, again, what was in our heart. When we can give it away and be joyous, truly give it away and need it yeah. and be joyous, this world doesn't have a hold on you anymore. Even when you're having mm. a bad day and you can give the person behind you a smile in line at the store or something or the clerk who's having an awful day. Sometimes it's, it's, it's not a dollar bill. Sometimes it's a kind word. Sometimes it, that's right. Yeah. We live in a world that's so busy. I'll just share real quick. I was in a, one of these mega box stores. You know, you can't see the ceiling or the other end of the building. And I get yeah. to the checkout and the woman says, oh, it was two for the price of one. And I'm like, oh, that's got to be like five miles away. I'm thinking, <laughs> my back hurts so bad. My feet are killing me. Ah, oh. I just said, that's okay. She looked at me. She said, that's ridiculous. <laughs> so she calls this young guy that works there. And he runs back. He comes up to me. And he's huffing and puffing. He said, I'm sorry. I'm like, you have no idea how big that was. He said, what? I said, I couldn't walk that far. And he looked at me. He said, you? I said, yeah. I said, I know I don't look it, but I'm really broke. I'm disabled. I said, you made my day. Thank you. Mm. His world stopped. He got all teary-eyed. He, he didn't know what to say. And I smiled and I thanked him. So you don't think he's not going to be looking for me the next trip in. Mm. We forget that we've been gifted. And sometimes we forget we bury it in the dirt, especially if we think we only have one talent. And coming back to 2 Corinthians in chapter 8, mm. Paul said, this isn't based on what you don't have. It's based on what you have. None of us have an excuse that if we got more, we could do this better. 
Paul said, we already have more than what we should have. We need to do it better now. And I'm not pointing a finger at anyone. I'm just saying that's, that's what I see Paul saying. I see him rustling there, just trying to get us to, to break free from our wrestling. He said, you already have it. Even in your poverty, in your giving, you gave all. And your heart got it. That's, that's where I see it. We all, we all have more than enough. We all have the gift. It's just, what are we doing with it? Especially when we think we only have one or none. But we all have more than one. We do. We really do. All of us. Well, I think I think I think sometimes we, we, we can probably get into the idea of comparing our own say our own ministry. If you have a ministry like Don or Wesley or, or someone else, you know, and you, you might carnally think all oh, my ministry isn't as big as some other people's ministry or I'm not doing enough. Um, mm-hmm. and, and there's that equating with the world again. We don't need to equate with the world, <laughs> but it, but sometimes we can let our minds wander and think, oh, I need to be doing more. I need to be doing more. Um, but you're right. It's not just about money. Um, mm-hmm. It's about time as well. We can we can give our time to people and give our you know, and, and, and just help in that manner. Amen. Well, I'm glad you, you said that. And it, it's not just money and it's not just it's not just stuff. It, it's mm-hmm. perspective. It's heart. It's it's everything. Jenny always says to me, she says, I feel like I do nothing for God. I go to this godless place and in this godless environment. And I'm like, perfect. Because the only God they can see is you. This is perfect. There's a story, that the true story. Go way back. Uh, I don't know what third world country, two gentlemen, shoe salesmen, as the story goes. They get off the ship. Uh-huh. The first salesman goes to the telegraph, sends back bad move, cancel all orders, taking next ship home, nobody wears shoes here. The second guy goes up, excited beyond words, says stop everything you're doing, triple production, send every shoe you can make here. Nobody wears shoes here. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But you know, that's a true story. We know it's a land of dark. We have some light. Paul says, this kind of light, the world just can't see. They've never, they don't see it. Matter of fact, it's so hard to see, you can barely find it amongst the brethren. And that's why he commended them so much. And that's when he reminded them, we'd be known by our love for one another. The one that costs. Yeah. But we have that we have that treasure within us, you know the the the, the spirit within us, Christ in us. That's that's the light, and, and 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 we you know he should be using our body for us to demonstrate that light to other people. Amen. You know, but it's let's. How does that happen? You know, Daniel. Uh, this past summer, I had to go in for surgery. It was gruesome. It was bad. Everybody, a lot of the people on the call know about it. Not everybody. You know, two weeks, it was the worst surgery of my life. It was a nightmare when I woke up. Agonizing pain, uh, oh. paralyzing uh, body parts. Uh, two weeks afterwards, I feel good. Four weeks, I'm still <gasps> feeling good. Six weeks later, the screws come out of the hardware. I got to go back in for surgery. Mm. Talk about being pushed beyond all reason. What in the world did I have to offer? accept a broken heart and ask God to save me. I couldn't imagine going through it again. And yet he put such a peace in my heart and in my wife's heart that when we walked in that place, there was, there was such an atmosphere. Everybody had to come and talk with us, doctor after doctor. We got to share all the nurses and endless barrage of different specialists. And they all just had to see the screws that came out. And, hear this guy talk about God being happy and confident and that wasn't in us we couldn't prepare for that what did we have to offer you know two fishes five loaves if that wow 
Well, I mean, it's wonderful that, you know, you think that in your suffering, I mean, that is a suffering and your personal worry and your wife's worry, that you're able to, uh, <laughs> to give the gospel to people and uh, and be an example of uh, godliness to other people. That's, that's wonderful, to be honest. Yeah. It, my first surgery was so bad when they were getting ready for the second one. The anesthesia team recognized me and wrote on my chart what a horrible time they had with me. They were so upset. And when I woke mm -hmm. up from the surgery, it was absolutely painless. Nothing hurt, not the incisions, not the drilling. They were inside my neck for two hours and nothing hurt to this day from that surgery. Mm -hmm. It was a complete miracle. No oh, doubt. Wonderful. And I got to tell everyone. So I went with nothing to offer except a broken heart. <laughs> and I must admit, I was not terrified. I wasn't happy. No, I wasn't terrified. Mm. And there was a confidence that my God would deliver me. And I told him that. I really did. And he did. That was the beauty of, of it all. So, you know, when we talk about these things, religion leaves it at some talking level. God says, no, no. This is the heart. And Paul says, you know how, I, how this works? When it takes your heart and it takes the empty pocketbook that you put something in it to give to someone who has even less, with less of an outcome. Well, well I mean, you, well, you, you, I mean, we we brought it up before about the about the heart, or you know, rather our our, our mind. I think it, it obviously says we need to, you know, have the mind of Christ, or we have the mind of Christ, you know, and 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 there's various things about the heart, Romans. Romans 5.5 5, um, touches on it nicely. Um, you know, and hope, hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And, and this similar theme is, is brought up also in, in, in Galatians. Galatians 4.6. And it says, and, be, and because ye are sons, God have sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So, you know, when we have a heart which is conditioned and uh, has that sort of um, the love of God shed abroad in our hearts, then you're right, absolutely. We should be emanating the same, the same thoughts as, uh, as Christ did when he was uh, walking with God in his ministry. And when you, when you look at these things, too, you, it reminds me of the, of the two commandments that fulfill the whole law. And that's love yeah. the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. That, that, that just wraps it up. I mean, that, that just takes care of everything on it, doesn't it? I mean, if you're doing that, you're going to fulfill this. <laughs> For sure. Well, absolutely, and 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 uh, I, I well, not not on a different topic. I just quickly mention it. I, I was trying to explain to someone um, some differences between between the the Mosaic law and the New Covenant, and uh, the fact that obviously some people think, oh, we're not under the law, but well, we're under the law of Christ. Obviously, in Romans three right. twenty seven, we come under the law of Christ, and don't, don't you brought it up? It's love God with all your heart, body, mind, soul, and strength, and, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. But but these two commandments completely encapsulate the the ten commandments. Exactly. Um, and and of course the fourth commandment, which many people still you know some sects still still keep that. And I don't I don't maybe question someone keeping it, but I would say that our rest our rest is in the Lord. We rest in the Lord. He is our Sabbath rest because we're not doing our own works. We're doing the good works that the Spirit gives us to do. And, and that fulfills the, the Sabbath rest for us by being in the Lord. So, you know, the Ten Commandments have always been have always been the sort of eternal law of the Father. And in the New Covenant, we're keeping them, as you say. Uh, love your neighbor as you love yourself fulfills all the law. And the righteousness of the law is fulfilled who tho for those who walk by the spirit and not in the flesh. Uh, you can't get more simple, <laughs> really. Yeah. Amen. Well, you know what I find amazing is that when you look at the word of God, God started off in the beginning and Adam and Eve and made it real simple. Listen to what I tell you to do and obey me. Mm. And, and we couldn't figure that one out. 
we collectively. And we know that's true because we all have sinned, just as the Bible yeah. has said. Second time, he writes it down in the law. And for thousands of years, we still can't get it right. Look at the history of Israel. Christ comes to earth, lives it perfectly. It gets written down, endless story and book after book. And yet the world still struggles on what God wants us to do. <laughs> so first he told us, then he wrote it down, and then he lived it out. And we still can't figure out what to do. Is That's that amazing? It got, so, it got so confused on what the modern day the preachers are telling them in the seminaries, telling them that basically the teachings of Christ are done away with. It's all about this imputed righteousness and sin nature and all these things that Jesus never even spoke of ever. No. You know, throughout the four gospels and in the book of Revelation to the seven churches. So they, they, they leave all, all that, they leave all that, they leave out the teachings of Christ. But the scripture says in 2 Thessalonians 1 and 8, it says that the Lord is coming back with, with fiery vengeance on those that know not God and that obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ. But yet yeah. they don't obey the gospel of Jesus Christ because they think they're under a new covenant with, that, that they think Paul told them about that they don't have to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. That that's actually they saved without doing that. And therefore, this is what we have. We have a lost world that's proclaiming to be saved. I tell people, listen, you don't have to believe that he did what he did. You have to believe that you have to live like he did and did what he did. <laughs> yeah. There's a big difference. You can believe all day long that he came and did it. But if you don't feel obligated to even try it, how can you say you are his follower? Because what are we told? Those who claim to love him or live in him must yeah. live like him, like him. Where, you know, you turn your back on your career when that, if that opportunity comes. That means you drink the cup of the unpleasant death when it's presented and that's the only cup the father hands that walk but all of a sudden it just got easy what does he want what he put on my plate the cup he handed christ made that very clear god made it very clear to adam and eve do what i say if not you'll die yeah and they would have had access to the tree of life but <laughs> Exactly. But but no, they were denied access to the tree of life and kicked out yeah. because of their disobedience. I, I, I tell you a short story, very short, only take a minute. Um, a, a, a fellow, when I was in a, a previous understanding, put it this way, um, and uh, we, I used to read the scriptures diligently, although obviously not as deeply because I have a different understanding now. But we used to look at Romans together, this other uh, fellow brother and myself, and he used to read the scriptures in Romans 1. Uh, verse 5 and also in Romans 16 verse 26 it's like a bookend in the book of Romans and in verse 5 it will say but by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name and the brother and I used to used to debate over this thinking I wonder what that means I wonder what obedience to the faith means because it, it wasn't in our paradigm. It wasn't something that was in our understanding of what the gospel was about. What you mean? No, it can't mean we have to obey anything. No, we're not. We're under grace. We're not under, <laughs> we're not under this. And we yeah, should yeah, just yeah. ignore what, what it. Does what does obedience have to do with anything, right? <laughs> I mean, I know. And it's right at the end of and it's right at the end of Romans as well, you know, made known to all the nations for the obedience of the faith. You know, Paul's book ended the book of Romans, which is one of the key books, you know, for our understanding of so many, so many things. Justification. And, and it's right there. And, and, and people just I, I'm, I, now I look at it and I go, how did I miss all this stuff for several years? It's just absolutely crazy. Had a, had a veil over your eyes. Oh, completely. Completely at a veil. Um, yeah, not a veil over my heart, obviously, the heart of my understanding, my carnal mind. I was still walking carnally from time to time, and that's why the veil was there. Mm. Amen. Let's go to the next scripture, guys. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 
Yeah. And we'll, we'll begin at, um, uh, let's begin at verse 9, and let's take it to verse uh, 14. First or second Corinthians? That's first Corinthians 9. Okay. Verse 9 through 14. I'll go ahead and read it. It says, first is written. It's everybody, I'll wait for everybody to get there. Everybody there? Yeah. Okay, verse 9 says, yeah, we're here. I'm reading the King James, like Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. Uh, doth oh. God take care of the oxen? <laughs> Or saith he it all together for our, for our sakes, for our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that plows should plow in hope, and he that uh, threshes in hope should be partakers of his hope. If we have sown a few spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, and are not we rather, nevertheless we have not used this power. We suffer all things lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you mm -hmm. not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath God ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory in void. For I, for, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward, but if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed to me. Yeah. Oh, so he says, what is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge that I abuse not my power in the gospel. So it seems like what Paul is saying here, he's, he's mm. making a note uh, that not to muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. If somebody's uh, being communicated to in a way of receiving spiritual things, then they should communicate unto them those carnal things is what he was saying. He said, for they, if they preach the gospel, they should also live of the gospel. But yet at the mm. same time, he's saying, but I'm not going to make it chargeable to you because I preach the gospel. Uh, then, then woe is me. But he said, I do it freely that, so that he can gain in the Lord. Any comments? Well, the, the, verse 13 is quite um, intriguing because, um, you know, he makes an illusion. You know, do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the live uh, of the temple? But of course, we know that people that are in the body of Christ are the living stones of in the temple of the Lord. And so mm -hmm. therefore he's saying, you know, if we're preaching the gospel and we're given this authority by the power of God through the spirit, then, of course, we ought to be living by the other members of that of those people who we brought into the temple of God as well. So you know, it's like a mutual sort of um, love for each other. Um, one, one sowing, one, I think in first Corinthians, Paul talks about obviously him and other people, one sows, one waters, um, and God makes the increase. But of course, we're all, we're all part of the same temple of the living God. I wonder, uh, I wonder if in thought, maybe Paul was thinking uh, as he wrote in Philippians chapter two, where he says, let this man be in you, which was also in Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And we know the whole outcome, who, who then is obedient to death, so yep. that we could be made rich. Paul, though he has the right, said, like Christ, I'm not going to take the money for this. I, this is my sacrifice. Though Christ was equal with God, he said, I'm, I put that aside. I put aside my wealth. I put aside who I am. I will walk this earth. I will be tempted. I will starve. I will be beaten. I will die. I wonder. 
I wonder if if we sometimes forget that that is the life of Christ. When when Paul said, "For me to live is Christ." I, I used to get this glorious picture of like being like Christ and, you know, bullets bouncing off me and sin, the fiery darts won't stick. And no, it was him emptying himself of everything, being flogged, finally, a crown of thorns, a purple robe of mockery, only to be crowned with glory by his father. And that's to live as Christ. And we forget that. And, and we do. We forget that there's a cost to this, this life. And if we choose to live it for ourselves, we will lose it. Guaranteed. Yeah, man. Lose it, that remind, that re oh, go ahead. Amen, brother. Go ahead. No, I, and that reminds me of a passage I was just kind of skimming over through this in um, 1 Peter 3. Uh, it's 13 through 17, and it says, And he who, he, who, he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And that's that's it. I mean, a lot of people that are preaching the true gospel of Christ, they're mm -hmm. being defamed as as evil, um, as as enemies of the cross. Um, but in reality. Uh, we're the ones defending the cross, but we're doing it in, from a place of humility, meekness, fear of the Lord, and love of the brethren, um, and love of the truth. And it's been like that ever since, ever since Christ walked the earth. It's been that way. Everything's been backwards. Yeah, I remember his advice that he got while he was on the cross. Hey, you saved others. Save yourself. That, that was the advice he got as he was dying for their very sins. And he said, forgive them because they don't know either what they're doing. That's how far the deception's gone. Getting back to what we were talking about, too. Um, we've all been in diff various different church gatherings in the past that were in era. I think most of us have anyway. Maybe there's some that haven't. But mm. where you were pressured to to give money uh, and to give of what you had and uh, it was burdensome. It was uh, you now you have prosperity preachers that preach that gain is godliness like you quoted earlier, Daniel in First Timothy six, and tell you, you know, you're gonna Give a dollar, get back ten. You can give a hundred dollars, get back a thousand, so forth, and all that, and put pressure. So th that's been a real turnoff to a lot of people, as, as it as well be, well should be. And um, but I want to ask you a question, and um, may, may be a bit of a sensitive question, but I want to ask you this. And certainly, you know, we sometimes we certain I, I get concerned about asking questions. I'm not asking for myself. I'm like. Like Paul said, you know, we don't, we don't, we're not looking for something for ourselves. But I want to ask you, if somebody is preaching the truth and preaching the gospel and living by and living mm -hmm. the gospel, should he be supported by those that are being taught by him? Anybody? I, I think that person absolutely has the right to be supported. And I think they absolutely have the right to uh, refuse support if they don't want it. I don't think it, it means that someone must take it. And I don't think someone should be embarrassed to take it. Okay. Because we read here in 1 Corinthians 9, what I'm reading, mm -hmm. not the muzzle of the ox that treads out the corn, corn, things apparent there, what that means. And you go down to verse 14, it says, even so hath the Lord ordained, the Lord ordained this. That what they mm. which preach the gospel should deliver the gospel. What does that mean? <laughs> somebody's got somebody's got some stuff going on in the background. You may want to put your uh, speaker in, on mute 
so we can uh, hear what's going on. Okay, go ahead. I think there's a good precedent for it, Don. I, I, I think it seems um, that, yeah, if someone's preaching the word and, and they're being called, called by the Lord to preach the word and they're preaching the truth, there's, there's, then there's a precedent from those that have been brought into the temple of the living God, the body of Christ. If they need support to support them by, by, by the means they have to support them. Okay. The, the reason why I'm saying this is because we want to have the right balance as, as believers according to the word of God. We want to be in obedience to what mm. God's word says. And I've heard this so much, you know, because they, a lot of us have come out of the, those uh, settings that uh, we're pressured and so much. And so we can be tempted to think, well, we don't need to support that. But yet the word says to do that. Because he's saying this is ordained by God, that they which preach the gospel should also live by the gospel, not to muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. Though Paul says here, again, he says, just like, uh, you know, he said, basically says, but I'm not, he was making it clear, I'm not trying to pressure you into giving to me. Because I'm preaching the gospel free, pre freely. I, I'm called to preach the gospel. I'm going to preach the gospel. If you give to me, you don't give to me. But he said, this is what this is the way God has it to be. And, and, and I'm subject to correction. If I'm reading something wrong, please point it out to me because I want to have a good understanding of what it's actually saying here. So if somebody has something they have to say on it, that's according to the word. Please show me. Don, uh, brother, I, I feel wholeheartedly that anyone who is serving our Lord full in a vocational type sense where that. They are so consumed hour by hour by hour by hour each day that they can't support themselves. I don't see why that would even be considered offensive to want to support a person who works that way. On the other hand, there are uh, my situation in life. I've suffered in you know chronic physical pain for 45 years, but I worked up until I was 58 until the point I just literally that I couldn't function. If I was in a ministry at that point, there was no way I couldn't, there's no way I could work and stay alive. Working was literally killing me. I had to stop. If I was in a ministry, I would be prayerful that everyone I ministered to during my days that if I labored at night, like Paul, that if my body broke, that they would come to me in love and feed the ox that treadeth the grain. Mm -hmm. Don't muzzle the ox and, and volunteer that. I think it's an individual thing. I, I, to uh, throw it all out is, is horrifying and sin and, and hurts the gospel because there is, there is and there are right times and people and ministries that should be supported. I feel that wholeheartedly. My father was a self-supporting minister his whole life. He never got a paycheck. And at one point, he had two full-time churches. Man worked around the clock. He never took a paycheck and lived on faith. There were times we didn't eat. And if someone didn't knock on the door and leave a bag full of food, we would have starved that night. Mm. He didn't even know who left it. We would hear a knock on the door. There'd be a car in the driveway with a note on it says, Lord, put it on our heart that you need a new car. For real. It was That's incredible. Good. That's good. Mm. I don't know about you guys, but just, just sharing. Uh, the Lord puts on my heart uh, conviction. Every, every week, I put aside mm. money uh, to, to give to ministry um, here at the church or, or whatever. You know, so, because I don't want the, the enemy to get a foothold into stopping my giving to the Lord and being conscious of giving. So I do that every week. And I think it's a good thing, you know, that that uh, a person does that, you know, whether, it, you know, just like anything, uh, spending time in prayer every morning and uh, spending time in the Lord, uh, studying his word. Those things are just things that come natural, I, I feel like, to those that believe to, to have a, a conscious of giving and a conscious of praying, a conscious of, of, of studying the word of God, a conscious of fellowshipping with other like minded believers like we're doing this morning. And I'm, I'm so happy to be part of of all of you guys lives and, and being able to share these things 
and hash through these things of what the word says so that we walk according to what God wants in obedience to his commandments and his ways through love. Mm. Amen, Don. And, and I agree. We, uh, Jenny and myself, we do put money aside regularly and we do make sure that it goes to proper to people who need it in and in a ministry level sense as well. And we're very careful with that. And we also pray. We also pray that our eyes are always open. Our ears are always open to the Lord. The Spirit's leading to meet the needs of people that become our neighbor, that stranger at, at the tractor supply store, or, or the true neighbor that's a mile away that you just don't meet, but his car broke down in your driveway, that type of thing. And we do make uh -huh. a very conscious effort because if we don't, what are we doing? Yeah. What are we doing? And again, it's not the amount. It's the intent of the heart. You know? Did I willingly? Could I not yeah. wait to give it away? Or did I begrudgingly let go of it? <laughs> well, I know in uh, later on, we, uh, I know I came on late, guys. I wasn't sure if you guys touched on this. But in 2 Corinthians 9, Paul talks oh. about this. It talks about, uh, you know, verses 6 um, all the way to the end of the chapter really you know, through 15 he talks about being a cheerful giver and um, you know those who sow sparingly will also reap sparingly he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully and that could be a lot of different things but and, and in the context of this he's talking about giving to the saints giving to the people that need help um, mm -hmm. he who supplies the needs of the sower the bread for the food supply and, and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all li uh, liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgiving to God, while through the proof of his ministry they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. For by their prayer for you, you long, or who long for you because of the exceeding grace in God that's in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Um, so giving with a cheerful heart, giving if somebody needs it, absolutely. And my wife and I, you know, we live in, we live in a big city. We live in Phoenix and, and the, uh, the abundance of, of, of people on the streets have just been incredible over the last 10 years. It's, it, it seems to be somebody's asking for money uh, on every single corner. And we've, we've made a point to just, just give because at that moment we're giving to God, hoping that maybe they can shine some light in them. What they are going to do with the money, it's not, a, it's not my concern. That's, that's a, to, to handle that with them but i give because i give to god because you know i guess i give to the least of these i give to him and that's something that my wife and i have really um made a point of so we'll just reach into our wallet and if it's a ten dollar bill it's a ten dollar bill if it's a dollar it's a dollar but we we, we give and you know we, we say a word of encouragement to the person give them a little bit of light speak some life into their life mm. in that moment um and hopefully god will will, will, will use that seed and, and make it grow so um that's 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 where my heart is and you know and if i give with the expectation of getting something back then it's worth nothing so. yeah we had uh, been over the scripture that you quoted so you you're right on right on course with us so thank you for sharing that um also, um, let's go to, uh, if you don't mind, First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. Interesting scripture here. <laughs> I've got it highlighted. I knew I'd get that sharp a lot of you, Daniel. <laughs> uh, let's start at verse 6 and, um, and go to verse 8. Yeah. First of all, it says, uh, talks about the widow, it says, but she that lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. You know that. And <laughs> these things give in charge 
that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel, an unbeliever. Wow, that's heavy duty. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's pretty convicting. And I don't think it just means of his own house, of the people he lives with. I think yeah. that talks about really that the house of God, <laughs> all of the people in the body of Christ. <laughs> it also, yeah, it, it, it's, so this, this fellow's not provided, so obviously he's not work, wanting to work, right? Mm. Uh, somehow, no, he's not, he's not provided, because if he was working as hard as he could, he couldn't provide, that's a different thing. But mm. I think the fellow mm. he's talking about here is somebody that just don't want to work, they're lazy or whatever it might be, and he's not providing for us, or are they spending their money on worthless things or, or whatever it might be? And and he's professing to be a, a believer. He's not. He, the Bible says that he's worse than an unbeliever. <laughs> I mean, he's in bad shape if you're not getting out and working, providing for your house. And that's why the scripture goes on and talks about, uh, you know, others where it talks about, uh, and we'll get to that. And maybe we'll go there next where it says that he who does not work, neither should he eat of not supporting those that are that are not willing to work. You know, instead of just giving to everybody that asks you, if the person is not working, Scripture says neither should he, neither should he, uh, should he, because you're enabling him to not not provide for his own house to be there. I believe you end up being a partaker of his sin. You know, it's interesting when Paul used the example about in the in uh, the desert where he said, "And those collected too much didn't have too much; those collected too little didn't have too little." He didn't say those who collected nothing got to eat. And there's a principle there. That's why he, he repeats it in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, where we started off. And he says, he brings up that very example. And so what's in that example? Well, let's say we're next to each other, Don. And you see me hobbling around with my cane. You know I can't use my left hand. And I'm trying to pick up stuff for my family. And I get two pieces of, of, of manna. And you're looking at me and you're like, be full, brother. I love you. Mm -hmm. and you got like you know eight baskets and you're like be full love you bunches you, you see and faith without works is dead <laughs> yeah but instead what do you do you come over and you say oh two loaves oh brother well i hope you're gonna have some left over for the family here let me help you <laughs> <laughs> here matter of fact eat a loaf while i carry you and the two loaves you there see you there go. But you see the love that's there there would no no one would have to command the one who picked too much to say whoa you need to share do you see that i, I mean i i yeah. that's what i sense that when that love is there because we're supposed to be known by our what our love for one another yeah that's good amen if we're done now let's turn to uh second thessalonians chapter three We're going to read from verse 6. Uh, from verse 6 to verse 15. Mm. Someone wants to read, go ahead. Daniel, you want to read it, if you don't mind? Oh, okay, right. <clears throat> okay, verse 6. Now we com uh, command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, and with quietness 
that they with quietness work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Go ahead and go ahead, keep going a little further. Go ahead and finish it. You would. Okay. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself gives you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. Amen. Uh, pretty strong verses there. Um, yeah. You, you know, he's commanding you to withdraw yourself from one that calls himself a brother and, and doesn't want to work, but is a busybody and uh, not to support him. So that's pretty, pretty strong. It is very strong. I mean, it's pretty telling. I mean, I'm, I mean, sometimes I, I think. I mean, obviously, when when they say neither should he eat, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not disposed to thinking that man may have a house. If we take it to a modern time, you know, he's going to go home and eat food. So I don't think it's eating necessarily in the real sense of food, but I think he's not partaking of the spiritual food that he receives from being among the brethren. That's that's how I perceive the not eating in a more spiritual understanding. He's not receiving the truth of the fellowship you would he would get. That that might be Daniel. Why we have such problems with um, with with people that don't want to work, so they just draw unemployment and food stamps and welfare and all these things while that's broke. It's because the the, the United States is is over here in the U.S. We support people that don't work. You can still get money, you know, to eat. <laughs> So it's the opposite of what the word said. If they didn't have that, then they would have to work. But a lot of people just want to live off the government so they don't have to work. Or they want to come up with that they uh, have these uh, problems that are that are not legitimate. Um, not in a case like like David or other people know where you're really genuinely hurt and you need that. And that's a great blessing to, to be able to have that. But to those that just use the system because they don't want to work. And if you got a brother, so so say you got a brother that's calling himself a brother, and he's just work, mm -hmm. just drawing off the government, and he's not because he don't want to work, and he's just coming up with excuses, and he really just doesn't want to work. There are things he can do, and that kind of kind of puts a point on that. Well, Don, I think yeah, I think no I think they're valid. Yeah. I think they're valid points. Sorry, I, mean, I just, you know, it, it, it just that bit on verse 10 where it says, you know, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. I'm, I'm just I'm just thinking also, you know, that that point you made is true, Don. I'm just thinking about would not work. I'm, I'm just reminded about James saying that faith without works is dead. You know, and when we come to the idea of giving, you know, a genuine faith. Mm -hmm. would be manifested by those mm -hmm. who give from the heart. And so they're not producing works. That, that faith is professing faith, but they're not demonstrating the love from their heart for the other brethren. So they're not essentially working because they're not giving. So mm -hmm. therefore, why should they participate of the spiritual food that they will receive mm -hmm. by being among brethren? So I think there's a dual purpose, a spiritual truth to that as well, personally. I mean, yeah. that's just yeah, you're right. another way. Of it, that's good, Dean. Yeah. But there are times, Don, for sure, I've, I've been thrust into positions where a person, family member, uh, again and again and again, bad decision, bad decision, bad decision, money, 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 way many times past reasonable. And at what point does love cover a multitude of sins and then you must hold that person accountable? And love is to not give in. Love is to see them lose everything they should have lost a hundred times ago. But you can't help. And it's not easy. And it is difficult. But if you look at a, a person's life, that is exactly how God leads us through this world, individually, corporately. If it was not for the hardships of this life, would anyone pay attention to him? Would any, did anyone wake up one day and say, I'm going to go find God because I'm so happy? No. So, sometimes all. it's difficult, um, David, to, to really see those that legitimately 
are working as hard as they can and just can't make it versus those that are just either living off the government or living off somebody else. Most people in the flesh want somebody to take care of them, whether it's Absolutely. the government, somebody, or something else. Mm-hmm. They they don't want to work. And even some of them that work, they don't want to give because they only conscious of their own of their own uh, wants or desires. Mm-hmm. And that's what separates believers from unbelievers. A lot of times you can tell who who a believer and who is not a believer just by in their giving and their praying and their you know because they they have no interest in it. Uh, they shun all that and they they want to talk about God. They want to talk intellectually, but mm-hmm. when it comes down to, to losing their own life. They don't want to lose their life. They no. don't deny themselves to help somebody else. Mm-hmm. That's, that's right. a good point. Well, we, we do live in the age of how can I help without being personally involved? And we yeah. do live in, in an empty society where Paul reminded us that the love of many would wax cold. We'd be lovers of self, truce breakers. Yeah. I mean, the list goes yeah. on and on. And there's some very simple things in that list that we've lost a long time ago. And that, what? Uh, but I'm agreeing with you, Don. Uh, there are... I've been put in that situation and it is hard to say no. And you do see the person losing it and they really didn't do anything to help themselves. But yet you become, not you, I became the pivotal linchpin in all of this. And I, I said, just because I'm here doesn't mean you should get everything because you know me. I mean, you have to work. I mean, you're 30 years old. I mean, the story goes on. It's it's a tough time when you get put in that position. And you have to. And the person I had to do that with, it took years before they ever would even think of talking to me, let alone thanking me mm. for making them face the music finally. You know, you, got the, other, you got the other side too, David, That uh, and all you guys were people are giving to their religious organization mm-hmm. thinking that because of their giving that they're going to make it to heaven because they do these works, you know, these wonderful mm-hmm. works of giving to these ministry, giving to this, all this different stuff. And a lot of people give a lot of money, but the scripture also says there it is, you know, you can give your body to be burned. You can give to the poor all that you have. And if you have not love, it doesn't profit you anything. So the motive of the giving has to be, you know, again, back to the same thing, always brings us back to the same two commandments, you know, uh, of loving your neighbor as yourself, of loving the Lord, your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength, because we see a lot of giving out there, but, but they looking at it toward as, as if it, that's going to be their salvation when they still walking in sin and thinking they'll maybe somehow God will, uh, 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 bless them and give them salvation for their giving. Mm, yeah, and then you cross the line and almost into into Catholicism at that point because they think they're earning their way in heaven by what they give. Um, yeah. Plus, so, one, sometimes the most loving thing that we can do for somebody is to tell them no. I mean, mm-hmm. God, Jesus chastises those who he loves. He tells me no all the time. Um, and I've learned how to be obedient. And, <laughs> Amen. You know, and in and, and the very last the very last verse in that in, in what we just read was to not count the not count the brethren as an enemy, but to admonish him as a brother. And admonish is to warn, to counsel, to exhort. So mm. I'm gonna tell you no for this because this is what I see. I'm 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 the fruit inspector. This is the fruit I'm seeing in your life. This is why I'm going to tell you no, but this is how we should go ahead and work together to get you what you need to get, whatever that situation is. And I, I learned through the, my, yeah, I learned through my son. I um, have a son. He's in the fellowship now. He's 41 years old, and he's fired up for the Lord and walking in the truth. But for so many years, from when the time he was 15 years old, he's been in and out of prison, and I would bail him out and get him out and help him and spend the money on doing it. And he kept going back over and over and over again. Until finally, you know, the Lord put him a heart, quit. You're enabling him. Don't do that. And I finally, I quit. And he spent a year and a half in jail. And I didn't get him out. And uh, mm. now he's finally learned through what he went through. You know, you, I'm saying this because you talk about enabling. 
and uh, and you hold people up from from actually getting because people need the, that that hardship to go through from the from the result of what they sowed. About like the scripture says, said he that sows to the flesh shall reap corruption, and and so it needed that hardship. And but now he's out, and he says he learned so much through that that it changed his life. He didn't go back this time. He's serving God with all his heart. He's a completely different man. He told me the other day, I shared with the group last night, he was in, he was in a, a, a restaurant and he's single and he, he's avoid, he avoids e evil to such an extent. He said, I was sitting there and there was a woman in front of me on the table next to me, half dressed, looking at me. And I saw her looking at me and I thought to myself, if I look at her, our eyes are going to meet. And then that's going to lead to me, me to go give her my phone number or vice versa. Then I'm going to, then it's going to go right back to the same thing I was. He said, he got up from the table and he went to another chair to put his back to the woman. So, so, you know, so that he, he wouldn't see her. <laughs> he took the way of escape. But to, to finally stop and let him go through what he needed to go through. And I think that's what's happening here. Paul says, don't enable these people that don't want to work. Don't give to them. So that they can learn, they got to work themselves to pay their own way, or else they'll never learn. They'll just keep coming back to you. They'll just keep living off of you, or living off the government, whatever, instead of learning from what they go through. That's why he says, still admonish them as a brother, but warn them, you know, that what they're doing is not right. Yeah, and I think the the, the big message in in the false church too is they they confuse conviction of the Holy Spirit with condemnation from Satan, and especially in their sins. So like, oh, you don't condemn yourself. Don't condemn yourself. Don't feel bad about sinning. Just ask forgiveness. And, and, and some people even go as far as saying, don't even ask for forgiveness. You're already forgiven. Just suppress that. But that's really the conviction of the Holy Spirit on our conscience. But the more you suppress that, then obviously you start searing that conscience and mm -hmm. become reprobate to the truth. And Paul even mm. says, do not quench the Spirit. Um, so I think sometimes when we back up back to this topic of enabling, I think sometimes if we enable somebody like that to a point to where it's becoming repetitive. I think we are then in, in that moment, almost taking the place of the Holy spirit, quenching the spirit in his life, that conviction that's probably pulling on their conscience, as opposed to thinking it's condemnation from the enemy, because they quote a million times, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, they know that verse real well, but they never finish it, and they 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 confuse that. So um, yeah, the problem is that they don't get is that you're supposed to be in Christ. There's none to those that are in Christ Jesus. <laughs> they, they just don't exactly. Not in exactly. Christ, you're living after the flesh. Exactly, but I, I've been, I've been in fellowships before where you know we would be talking about you know our sins and then. One brother would get up and be like, I felt guilty. I asked for forgiveness. And the guy that was really in the group said, no, 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 don't condemn yourself. Don't yeah. condemn yourself. Yeah. And, but that's really conviction. <laughs> so Yeah. And it's like you said, they're searing the conscience with a hot iron. The horse are becoming callous. So sin doesn't even bother them after a while. They have no conviction anymore. And that's a dangerous condition. You end up with a reprobate mind. Very dangerous place to be in. Let's go to one. It is possible to come asked. back from it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Let's go to the next scripture. Yeah. No, no, no. No, it's all right. I, I, because the no, next scripture is fine. <laughs> uh, it's Ephesians chapter four and verse 28. Yeah. Mm. We'll start at verse uh, 27 and read uh, verse 27 and 28. Uh, Daniel, you want to read that? Yeah. OK, so uh, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Mm. So so the real reason we work is not for ourselves, but what this scripture is saying, but to give to him. That needs, that is a need, right? Yes. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. So, anybody have any com other comments?
I think it's been good this morning. Uh, we went through a, a, a good bit of scripture and uh, and on giving and receiving com and communicating. There's yet even more than that we could go through, but uh, I think that pretty much uh, sums up what we are, uh, what chapter uh, eight of Second Corinthians eight, and also pretty much Second Corinthians nine as well. Um, so I, I think it brought it brings a lot of clarity to that I'm thankful for you guys and, uh, that to receive the word of God with gladness and uh, and if it deals with any of our hearts you know then we know that uh, we need to uh, listen to that conviction and and take care of it and, and walk in in what the scripture says um, and, and so I, I thank God that we're open to the word of God. We, we, we want to be a, walk in the word of God and listen to the word of God. And the word of God is an authority in our life. Anybody have any further comments? Uh, it's just always a joy to meet together and, and open God's word, to pray, to share, to hear other people's perspective and to, to mm -hmm. read the same words and hear how those words are lived in another person's heart and mind and life. That's priceless to me. That's encouragement. That, that's iron sharpening iron. And uh, I really depend on that. And I, I, I love you guys and girls out there. And um, this isn't a nice option. This is mandatory for me. I, we have been starving looking for fellowship like this. And yeah. to have it is so sweet. So we must give all, all, all credit to God and all praise to his name. And just want to share that with everyone. Amen. Thank you, David. Amen, David. Well, yeah. Amen. Amen. I love being able to read scripture with you guys. And then the Holy Spirit will convict me and show me of another scripture that will speak and the Holy Spirit's convicting somebody else about a different scripture, but we're, we're constantly um, comparing scripture with scripture and building off of it and just reaffirming what it says. Um, and it's amazing. It's, it's just, it's amazing. Even though all of us were all over the world that we're still one in oh. unity and God can still work through all of us. And God is among yes. us. Absolutely. God is among us, even though we're on completely different opposite ends of the earth. Uh, it's 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 truly a miracle. People say there's no miracles anymore, but this, the, you know, it's a miracle I found you guys. <clears throat> and I've grown so much just in the few weeks I've been been with you. So I love you all. And I really, really do appreciate um, the time and, and the love that all of you guys have. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I want to say that. Uh, it's it's a massive miracle that any of us have what we have in Christ. I am so thankful that God opened our eyes to see the truth and to walk in the truth. It's a massive miracle, and I'm so and I'm very very thankful. Uh, I'm thankful to see what the Lord is doing in each of our lives. We haven't been together that long. And uh, God is doing some great things. It's, it's amazing how like-minded we are because it's the Holy Spirit that we're all dependent upon to teach us through his word. And we're all here because we listen to the word of God and not to some other body, somebody else or some popular teaching out there. I'm, mm. I'm thankful. Last Sunday at 530, the church at 530 is a house here. We had over We had 48 people tuned in. Uh, my house was full wow. of people. Full wow. Of people. Uh, Wonderful. <laughs> I, mean, I couldn't fit another seat in here. My wife's talking about trying how to get more, more chairs in. Um, we had people on, on Skype, people on YouTube chimed, chimed in. Uh, God is doing a great work. You know, he, it's like the mystery of iniquity is being revealed and people are starting to come out. Uh, and, and I know it's a few compared to the multitudes and multitudes, but like Dave said, the percentage of... Uh, of what few it is, 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 is small compared to the amount of people out there. But I am just so full of thank thankfulness to be able to be part of you guys and to uh, share with you guys and to hear you guys share with me and help me. Uh, I'm so thankful. And I just want to thank every one of you. I pray for every one of you daily, which I know a lot of you do. And I thank, and I thank you for your prayers. I covet your prayers. And uh, thank you for, for all the support that we give to each other in this ministry. Thank the Lord. Amen. Amen.
And then, yeah, Don, I, I, uh, I tuned into your, uh, tuned in in the service last Sunday night. It was my first time tuning in. Thank you. Uh, that, that was cool. I like, I really did enjoy it. I enjoyed that a lot. I enjoyed the interaction. I enjoyed the songs. Um, so that was, that was a blessing. Keep, keep that up. And I'm sure, um, you know, with through God's grace, things will grow and people's eyes will, will begin to open. So, uh, I, I bless you and, um, really appreciate what, what you're doing as well. I just don't know why y'all can't all move over here and come be with us. <laughs> <laughs> if Especially you, Daniel. Closer. <laughs> whoa, whoa. As you know, as you know, Don, I used to live in the States for three years. And um, yeah. my, 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 my wife and my two boys, both of which still live with me, although they're adults, um, they're all American passport holders. <laughs> So, okay, well, good. They're Send not. Good. They're not. Send they're not British. In. So I'm. I'm the odd one out in the family. <laughs> well, I know my wife and I. We're looking to relocate here in about three years or so from Phoenix. So we'll def. We'll. We'll definitely put that on the list. Keep of, that uh, in the, mind. The, the so you got like-minded brethren that come be with I, us. Help us. I, I need would, some help over here. <laughs> I would love to. I would absolutely love to because you know I got a small thing going on in Phoenix over here too. But um, yeah, no, yeah, good. it's it's fun. Amen. I, I encourage y'all too, guys, if you're there um, in, in the different places, the various places you live, even if it's just you and your wife to start out and uh, mm. join in with us on, on Sunday evenings, whatever, and have service and begin to build upon that and uh, let more and more people come in to, to, to outreach to others. I uh, encourage you to do that. You know, it's a blessing. And, uh, and, I'll, and if I can be of any help to you, uh, please let me know, you know, that, and I'll be, be there for you. So, uh, you guys are a blessing. Uh, thank you for each one. Um, David, would would if if anybody has something, does anybody else have anything to say? Any maybe some people didn't even get to say didn't say anything today. Uh, anybody else that want to open up? Um, any comments? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, David, would you would you close us in prayer then? Sure, I'd love to. Let's bow our heads and eyes, and let's pray. Father, what a glorious time. Thank you for this group that has gathered together around you in truth and honesty. I pray in humility of heart before you. I pray that we're open books, Father, that our hearts are yours. I pray that no distractions, Nothing else would sneak in and capture the thoughts that you've put in our hearts from this time together. Thank you how open and easy it is to share our very hearts. Thank you for the spirit amongst us that is so gentle and kind. Thank you for the rebuke of your word, the conviction of it as we share. Thank you, thank you for the hope that only, only resides in you. Thank you for the gospel that has set us free. Thank you for the truth that is in our hearts. I pray that we would burst if we don't open our mouths, Father. I pray that you'd open our eyes to see those that you've put in our path that so desperately near, need to hear that word from our mouth. Make us bold in your spirit, we pray. All glory, all praise, all honor belongs to you. And in your son's name we pray. Amen. You know, guys, there was a uh, thank you for that, David. There was a there, Amen. Was, there was a couple at the gym, and um, he just had really, really foul language coming out of his mouth, and I just waited on the Lord. And then I went up to him and I said, "Listen, I said, um, the Scripture says in James one that uh, that uh, if a man claims to be a Christian and has and does not refrain his tongue, his religion is his Christianity is worthless." And he looked at me and he said, yeah, he said, man, I know, you know, I, I, I have a filthy mouth and this and that. He said, I'm sorry, you know, but, uh, you know, this and that. We started talking and, and he said uh, that him and his wife were going to counseling and, and some Catholic thing or whatever. And I said, mm -hmm. well, you know, we have church at my house on Sunday evenings and I'd love to be able to help you uh, if, if you would be interested in coming. And, you know. He's coming now, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> praise God. Guitar, and he's uh, him and his wife came with us all the way to Pierport last night, and they coming back again tonight. <laughs> and uh, I'm praise just so God. excited, man, to see what, to see God doing things like that. I didn't really say that much, guys, but he 
he's coming in and listening to the word and listening to the truth and uh, praise God. Uh, so Amen. You never know. <laughs> what a blessing. He'll be here tonight. Uh, he'll be playing the guitar with me. And uh, so uh, cheer him on if y'all, if you guys come on. <laughs> can encourage Amen. <laughs> but, uh, uh, that's a wonderful thankful. story. I'm thankful. And look, I want to tell everyone that uh, has been listening in on YouTube uh, this morning. Uh, thank you for um, tuning in to us. And uh, you can click the button below uh, there on the site uh, for to subscribe to, to get future um, uh, videos of, of uh of, of us on Sunday mornings. Uh, we're very thankful to have you. Also to leave your comments if you need help. We want to be there to help you and minister to you and, and help you through whatever you might be going through. So thank you for tuning in and thankful to everyone here on Skype and everyone hearing us. Uh, what a blessing. I want to thank all of you for being here and for all of your encouragement and the words that everyone spoke. Amen. Thank you, guys. I love you guys. Uh, God bless everyone. God Amen, bless. brother. Wonderful words. Amen. Have a great week. See you next weekend. Love you all, brother. See you next week, guys. Anybody can, stay, anybody can stay tuned. Be with us tonight at 530 Central Time. Love to have you with us on Skype. Look forward to it, brother. All right, guys.